there we go. Finally popped up. So this is uh, today's pocket talk. We're going to be really hammering down into how is sleep related? Because that's one question, right? But then how do we help with some of the sleep symptoms we see? Um, and we could really think of that in normal aging, right? Because there's a process that happens in normal aging, but it's specifically as it pertains to neurodegenerative diseases. Um, I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this talk. Um, outline wise, I want to first just highlight like how prevalent is sleep apnea? What are some of the testing and treatment options for that? How is it related, right, to neurodegenerative diseases? Because uh, spoiler alert, it is related. Um, but then also how are medications uh, for sleep problems? What are the, at least the ones that we currently recommend um, and not recommend, right? Um, I actually took out just for time, I took out the restless legs portion of this talk. Um, I, if there's a question on it, I can always answer it. But um, <clears throat> let's start off with a case. So this is a 76 year old with three years, progressive memory issues. Um, you know, maybe some behavioral changes, some mild irritability and some day-to-day -day fluctuations. So if you ask anyone, right, there's good days, bad days, but there's these kind of clear day, different uh, fluctuations happening. Um, they've got a past medical history of high blood pressure, of uh, atrial fibrillation, their BMIs normal at 24. Uh, you do some review systems. They've got some increased daytime sleepiness. They're napping more than they were say five years ago. Um, they're little that, you know, like an Epworth uh, sleepiness scale only registered as a two though. Um, so it wasn't like a positive screening there, but the, the spouse mentions, yeah, they're snoring on most nights. Sometimes they're actually waking up with night sweats and it's not entirely clear why they're getting up to use the restroom multiple times per night. And uh, their neuro exams normal. When I do like a cognitive screening test, because, you know, they have memory problems, right? Um, they're scoring sort of a mild dementia range, right? They're missing points on attention, but also on memory, right? And so they're basically right around this mild dementia range, 26 out of 38. Uh, on their brain scan, so they've got mild to moderate vascular disease. Uh, now probably I should call this moderate. Um, all these little white spots and things, this is basically evidence of vascular disease, front of the brain here, back of the brain here. So they've got quite a bit of, uh, you know, this vascular disease developing. They've also got these little tiny cysts in the hippocampus. These are basically perivascular spaces that are occurring. Um, when you think about the risk factors for these vascular lesions, so there's the two we can't control, right? There's aging and genetics, um, but there are ones we can control uh, and high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, type two diabetes, well, diabetes in general, smoking history, sleep apnea, right? Those are kind of the big ones and, and sleep apnea often gets under-recognized there. If we look at, uh, so we, we do like a home sleep study, right? You get quite a bit of data these days of the home sleep study. We can look at what's their O2 saturation. That's their percent oxygen throughout the night, right? We're getting some drops below certainly the 90%. Uh, so concerning drops throughout the nighttime, we're getting some, especially in the middle of the night here, some apnea events occurring. This tells us which kind of, are they on their side? There's a little accelerometer that we can measure. Um, are they asleep or awake? Um, what's their heart rate doing? So oftentimes when we see these drops in oxygen, we'll see spikes in, in their heart rate, which also blood pressure, we aren't measuring that. Um, and then we can get a sense of their snoring uh, throughout the nighttime. So there's like an audio device as well. So you get quite a bit of data with a home sleep study these days, right? Um, in our patient, it came back with an apnea hypopnea index of 33.1. Uh, and then like when they're on their back, supine, 42, slightly less when they're not on their back, but still pretty prominent, right? So this is not a, just a positional sleep apnea. They've got severe sleep apnea. And so basically anything over 30 uh, is severe sleep apnea. There was no clear positionality with it. Um, this individual happened to have both some obstructive and central sleep uh, apneas present. Um, and an in-house polysomnography or sleep test was recommended to titrate a CPAP. Because um, one concern when you have central sleep apnea is a CPAP can actually worsen those. And so they have to monitor for that. Um, and oftentimes, especially if there's prominent central sleep apneas, they may need, may need a BiPAP device. Um, but a sleep specialist can help uh, that scenario. So should all sleep studies be done at home? 
Uh, there, there are definite benefits with this, right? So you could sleep in your own bed. That's that's uh, one nice thing about these. Um, when you look at like long, like seven day sleep studies or four day sleep studies, right? Sometimes they'll throw out the first night because there is disruption. You know, the brain's kind of on a vigilance, uh, uh, you know, radar up task uh, in an unfamiliar environment. So, so the data we capture from the lab sleep studies is not always is not always the best data, right? There's a lot more we can capture. Um, but it, there are some drawbacks to doing the in-lab studies. Um, the accuracy of the home sleep studies are pretty good. So it really depends on the patient and how they set it up and everything. So there's obviously complications with that, especially in patients with cognitive disorders, but if they've got someone that can help them out, right? Um, you know, the, the data we get back is pretty good for most patients. Um, when it's super mild, so when they've got like maybe an AHI of nine, right? But you're still quite concerned about it, or maybe even seven, um, that might be just that borderline result might be kind of a falsely low level. Um, and so even if you get like a level of five, but you're still highly suspicious, that might be a reason to consider an in-lab sleep study. Um, or if there's obviously any technical difficulties or just bad data that you're getting back, that might be a reason to consider the in-lab one. You also cannot capture REM sleep behavior disorder with a home sleep study, at least not the majority of ones that, that are used. Um, they aren't measuring EMG lead activity which is where we basically listen to the muscles. You can't exactly see which stage of sleep someone's in with these home sleep studies because we're not doing EEG measures like we do in an in-lab study. Um, so you can't see if they're in REM sleep when they're moving about, right? So so if you're concerned about REM sleep issues, then you got to do an in-lab sleep study. Um, and, then, and then we also wouldn't be able to capture any like, sometimes we say nocturnal seizures, especially frontal lobe type seizures, you wouldn't be able to see that because we're not doing EEG leads with home sleep studies. Um, but for like the question of is this sleep apnea or not, it's still a pretty darn good screening tool. Um, so what's the prevalence of this? And it's really variable depending on the population you study, right? It's more common in men. It's more common as we get older. It's more common in individuals that are overweight. There's all sorts of, you know, prevalent studies out there. This is divided in women and men. Um, the white line is just obstructive sleep apnea. And then when you have the S, it's like with daytime sleepiness. So you can see there's a, a large proportion of patients that have sleep apnea that don't necessarily have daytime sleepiness on their questionnaire, right? So like that Epworth sleepiness scale isn't always the, the end-all be-all of uh, does this patient have sleep apnea or not. Um, 2013 estimates that I found, so somewhere around like 26%, uh, you know, age 30 to 70. However, that number jumps up even higher in individuals over age 70. Um, and as our population becomes more overweight and obese, that number skyrockets up even more because that being one of the biggest risk factors. Um, there is a clear link between sleep apnea and Alzheimer's disease and any of these neurodegenerative diseases. So, you know, when we look at amyloid, um, if you've got a history of excessive daytime sleepiness, you're more likely to have amyloid plaque accumulation in the brain. Um, so that's like with population level data. Um, if you have reduction in the amount of sleep time, so like you're just not sleeping enough, right? You're more likely to have amyloid plaque accumulation in the brain. Um, sleep apnea is also associated with these increased amyloid loads. And the, the theory here, you know, that what makes sense is that there's a decreased, a decreased clearance problem. Um, and if we know that amyloid plaques are building up years before symptoms. So this red line, you know, this is in folks that are totally cognitively normal. There's like a 10 to 20 year window where there's changes happening in the brain well before someone, uh, you know, develops symptoms. And so we're missing out on a lot of risk here um, when we're ignoring sleep apnea. Um, so what does sleep have to do with it, right? There's actually a bi-directional effect here. Um, so patients with Alzheimer's disease are much more likely to have sleep apnea and patients with sleep apnea are at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, part of it is a lot of fragmented sleep starts to occur in Alzheimer's disease. So we can see change, you know, if you have tau pathology happening within the brainstem, which helps regulate um, some of the sleep cycle functions uh, that can, can disrupt sleep, it's specifically less slow wave sleep, which is really the problem here. Um, one study that looked at what is the, the rate of sleep apnea in Alzheimer's disease, especially in sort of mild to moderate dementia stages of it, it's 90%. 
And many of those cases were severe sleep apnea. So um, at least the majority were moderate to severe sleep apnea. And <clears throat> how could it be a risk for Alzheimer's disease? Well, there's something that happens at nighttime that just in the last, yeah, it's really been since about 2015. There's been mouse data going back a couple years before that, but we're talking about pretty new stuff of there's a, there's a whole system called the lymphatic flow that happens. You drain out uh, spinal fluid basically, you know, throughout the interstitial system. So you have a spinal fluid that goes all throughout the brain cells and it basically washes things out through the venous system. And this, when does this occur? 90% of this drainage occurs during slow wave sleep at nighttime, right? So that's the vast majority of our clearance mechanism. And so if you're not able to clear those out, you start to get amyloid plaques building up. You start to get pathology building up in the brain. Um, and sleep apnea specifically um, disrupts slow wave sleep. So we can do a sleep study with someone where uh, it can look a lot like this bottom picture where we get lots of rims. Well, you get a certain amount of rim sleep, a certain percentage of light sleep, sort of this in rim stage one sleep, um, maybe frequent awakenings throughout the night. They're not reaching the deep stages of sleep, uh, specifically stage three sleep. So that's like when we measure their brain waves, we can literally see the brain slow down from nine hertz to like three hertz. It's like three times reduction uh, in, in the amount of brain activity that's going on. Your blood pressure fully relaxes. It's when the brain is in its most relaxed state. That's when the spinal fluid washes out, right? And that's what gets disrupted both with aging and with sleep apnea. So there's a big link here that we're missing with neurodegenerative risk when we think about sleep and the importance of it. Um, when we age, we also have changes in our melatonin levels, which is part of the circadian rhythm. Uh, if you Google this, you'll probably find some, you'll find all sorts of information when you Google things, right? Um, this is not reality of like, it's not true that they just produce negligible amounts um, of melatonin. It, it probably looks more like this. This is like individual data changes over time where um, there is less production. There's quite a bit less. Um, and it makes sense pathophysiologically because the pineal gland is the main sort of production of this melatonin. It's through basically if you have light stimulation uh, and then it goes through some different brain pathways through the brain stem and then up to the pineal gland. Um, if you have basically light stimulation, it's going to inhibit uh, melatonin production. And um, what happens as we age? Well, the pineal gland calcifies. It basically, you, I can look at a CT scan and predict someone's age within a certain age range, right? Based on the calcification of their pineal gland. So it, it probably just doesn't work as well as we get older. Um, so that can disrupt your circadian rhythm, right? And that can start to mess with sleep as well. So back to our case, right? This individual did get uh, titrated on their CPAP. They were able to get their apnea hypopnea index lower than five, which would be normal. They've been wearing it for at least six hours for the last 12 months at the follow-up visit. Their short testamental status was actually improved. So they went from, if you recall, a, a score of 26 out of 38 to 32 out of 38 a six point improvement. It's still abnormal, right? They still have, you know, kind of more of a mild cognitive impairment range, but looks much better, right? We see them two years later. Um, their memory and daily functioning is worsening. Um, their, their spouse is actually having to help out with certain things around the house. Uh, and we find out that actually they stopped their CPAP about eight months prior. Uh, and they just didn't really notice any benefit, so why do it, right? That's, that was their rationale. Now their short testimonial status is 20 out of 38, so way worse. Um, this is what their brain scan looks like, so we're seeing more neurodegeneration of the hippocampus structures, those little cysts that we saw earlier are even larger, um, basically indicating that spinal fluid isn't draining appropriately, right? It's building up spinal fluid in those areas, but this is indications that there's actual brain damage going on. So why, you know, what do we see at a population level? I mean, if you're, <laughs> I was, I, I love this study because it, it does definitely kind of show us that there is a risk associated, but their definition of compliance of CPAP is uh, um, quite low. So this was a three-year retrospective study of looking at Medicare patients with sleep apnea. So all these patients have sleep apnea. 78% um, of them were using their CPAP as indicated. I put that in quotes because, uh, you know, their definition of adherence was if they're just getting refills over the three-year period, uh, there was really no like 
how, what percentage were they using it? You know, we, do, we use a lot more uh, stri stringent criteria for how, how adherent is someone in the sleep clinic, right? Um, but the folks that were not, you know, that were not adherent to their CPAP, um, they progressed to dementia. So these, these were folks that, you know, had mild cognitive impairment uh, and they progressed to dementia at a faster rate compared to the folks that um, were using their, their CPAP machine. So the odds ratio was 0.69 for those um, using their CPAP machine and similar to more of a Alzheimer's disease related dementia as well. What's the most common? So, so CPAP failure is extremely common. Uh, that, that story I gave you is, is, you know, I could tell that a hundred times over. Um, 40 to 50% quote unquote fail CPAP, uh, you know, throughout the use of it. Um, and there's, there's, there's like different groups of folks, right? There's, there's some folks where they notice the difference of it. It's night and day difference, right? To pardon the pun. Uh, but they wouldn't even like leave the house with it if they're going on vacation, right? So like, that's like a minority of folks though. That's like maybe a third or less of, of patients. Um, and then there's like maybe a quarter of patients or so where they try it and they literally just fighting the machine all the time. There's no way they're ever going to be able to sleep with this machine. It's actually causing more harm than good. They just throw in the trash, right? Um, they might need another alternative to CPAP, but a good majority of patients are here in the middle where they just need proper counseling on how important this is, right? Um, you know, Oh, I, I didn't notice the difference. Why I go through, I need to clean the machine. I need to do all these things, right? It's extremely important for brain health, right? For reducing risk of dementia for, you know, the, in that group, right? That adherence will go up if we emphasize that. Um, part of this sometimes is insurance compliance, right? So if they're not using it for, you know, a certain percentage of the nights, a certain percentage of the time, then basically it gets revoked, right? Uh, through the insurance uh, company. Sometimes there's a lot of other things going on, right? So deviated septum problems, the daily congestion, claustrophobia is a common one, right? That'd be in the group that uh, is just not going to work for them, right? Um, so what if my patient stops CPAP? Are there other alternatives? Well, it really depends on the scenario. How severe is the sleep apnea? Is it mild? Is it positional? Can they do, you know, I've had a patient where they, they wore sort of some sort of like backpack device that prevented them from rolling over. You can use body pillows, right? So sleeping on the side might be enough in some cases. Weight loss, right? If they're like severely overweight, um, maybe their BMI is over 35, maybe that's an option for bariatric surgery. We've got some new medications that look really promising for weight loss, right? Um, these are things that uh, that could at least help the severity of the sleep apnea, even if we're not able to fully treat it like we want to. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, everyone wants to choose, you know, I'll, I'll see the, I'll see the reports from our sleep specialists, right? Of like, oh, well, we talked about the different ways to treat it. And this patient wanted to choose weight loss. And if you're going to do that, you got to have real close follow-up, right? Because uh, cause that almost never happens, right? Um, we, we know how that goes. Even if somebody loses weight, they often gain it back pretty quickly. Um, so, but some people that, that just becomes that motivating factor and they can really adhere to that, right? So I'm not saying that's not uh, a possibility for everyone. Um, there are these dental appliances out there. Uh, they cost a lot of money. Uh, insurance usually doesn't cover them. They are better than nothing. They help basically improve the, um, you know, the the jaw line and, and the flow. But they can loosen over time. They require close follow up. Oftentimes, we'll recommend. Well, you should really have an overnight at, at the very least oximetry study to make sure it's working right. Uh, um, at least a certain you know six months down the road. Sometimes there's like tissue obstructing, right? That's causing the obstructive sleep apnea. So sometimes palate surgeries or tonsillectomies can sometimes help in some patients. And then there's this new Inspire device, right? So that's an option for some individuals, but not everyone. What does that look like? It's essentially uh, like a little pacemaker that helps keep the airway open. It actually juts the, the tongue and the jaw muscles out a little bit, uh, keeps the airway open. And it helps sort of uh, almost be like a little pacemaker for the airway. Um, and essentially you just turn this on at nighttime. You can put a delay of like, well, I usually fall asleep within 30 minutes. You can put a delay on it. Uh, and this can be an option for some individuals. It does require anesthesia. It's surgery, right? So that's, that's always something that I'm a little bit cautious about, right? Especially, um, for my patients with cognitive issues. But if I've got a patient with severe sleep apnea, they can't tolerate their CPAP. I know that is harmful to the brain, Right. This surgery is a potential risk, but it probably outweighs the you know the um, you know the benefits would outweigh the risk in those cases. 
Um, and so we've had a number of patients do this, even patients with Lewy body disease do very well with it, right? So, so I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic about it now. You can't have a BMI over, I think I saw 35 and one, but I think the most recent I saw was 32. You can't have like a super severe AHI. Um, you can't have a certain amount of central sleep apneas because this will not solve that issue. This is more a permanent obstructive problem, right? But it is an option for some. All right, clinical puzzle number two. So this is a 68-year-old with progressive cognitive uh, concerns. They've had neuropsych testing. They've got clear um, you know, executive dysfunction, visual spatial dysfunction, some memory domain dysfunction. They've got a history of insomnia, sleep apnea. They're not using their CPAP. They've got severe severe REM sleep behavior disorder, right? So they've they've actually injured themselves and their spouse due to their severe REM sleep. You're pretty confident in that like history, right? Um, they've got some non uh, you know cognitive issues going on, some more of systemic issues of constipation, orthostatic lightheadedness, daytime sleepiness, seeing shadowy figures, restless leg syndrome. Um, these are their medications. They're taking denepazil uh, at nighttime, and they're taking Tylenol PM at nighttime. Um, to help with their insomnia. And they've got masked faces, decreased arm swing on exam, right? So uh, I should ask you what's going on, but I'll, I'll just, in the uh, interest of time. So this, this is a patient that actually says probable DLB, right? I've given you a number of clues here. Acting out dreams, the cognitive testing pattern can fit with Lewy by disease, but these sort of uh, autonomic symptoms fit with, with this. Um, the neuro exam shows mild Parkinsonism, so they have at least two out of four criteria to meet uh, probable DLB. Um, this is a bit of an issue with the denepazil at nighttime, actually. So, so that, that can worsen REM sleep behavior disorder in our patients with, uh, with RBD. Um, so oftentimes, and, and sometimes I'll hear a story of, yeah, well, we tried denepazil, my nightmares and acting out dreams got so much worse that I just discontinued it. Well, we can solve that by moving it to the morning. That works in the vast majority of cases. Uh, so this is a patient that really needs denepazil. They just need it prescribed at the right time, right? And so modifying that in this individual would be very helpful. Um, the brainstem nuclei are involved. It, we see synuclein pathology within the brainstem, and that's what's basically making the muscles not getting that inhibition. Uh, so, so that's why they're starting to act out dreams at night. Um, and so in cases of at least of idiopathic REM sleep behavior disorder, that's almost like 90% of the time is associated with synuclein problems, which is sort of that Parkinson's and Lewy body spectrum. Um, melatonin can be helpful for REM sleep behavior disorder, at least in uh, about half of cases. Uh, and, and it suppresses the amount of REM sleep one has at night, which doesn't have a major impact on their cognition. Um, so it's a safe over-the-counter medication. And sometimes we have to get the higher doses though, to specifically work for the REM sleep problem. Um, but you're going to have some patients where it just has a paradoxical effect and melatonin is just not going to be a good option for them. Um, so in those cases, especially if the REM sleep issue is pretty severe, we actually do use a med that I say don't use, right? We use very low doses, 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams of clonazepam. That's a longer acting benzodiazepine that lasts throughout the night. And um, it can work like in 90% of cases, right? So it can work in the vast majority of cases to help with that specific REM sleep issue, especially if they're at, at risk of injuring themselves or others. Um, for insomnia, right? So like this individual is taking the Tylenol PM, that has, that's anticholinergic. It's it's basically counteracting his denepazil. It's like he's just taking drugs that are fighting each other, right? Um, so we'd, we'd want to stop that, right? Uh, and we're basically going to be utilizing melatonin as first line, again, just like we would um, in, in other individuals for sleep, um, but counseling them that, hey, this is not going to knock you out like your title PM, right? You still have to work on your sleep hygiene. You still have to work on, um, you know, getting prepared for sleep. The melatonin will just help supplement that, right? I, I sort of think of it kind of like it, it, it helps uh, promote sleep, but it's not a, you know, it's not going to force you to sleep. Um Oftentimes we'll titrate this up. So if three milligrams isn't enough, then we might try higher doses, but we don't like to just start with higher doses. We want to sort of give that time. Um, for REM sleep issues specifically, just to let you know, and, and even maybe for that frequent awakening in the middle of the night, uh, the, the sort of timed release version of these can be better because um, REM sleep tends to happen between the two to 6 a.m. That's when it clusters the most. So 
um, the early, you know, the, the, the sort of dissolvable tablet might not be enough um, if that issue is showing up. The second line agent, the other one that's at least is cognitively neutral that we recommend is trazodone. Um, and I don't have great options outside of melatonin and trazodone. They, yeah, there's like 99 different sleep aids out there, but in patients with cognitive disorders, these are our main two, right? Um, there are newer ones that might be interesting, uh, which I'll be excited to see more data about. But if they're having like what we call sort of, you know, psychological insomnia, sort of, the, I call it the mind racing phenomenon that's preventing them from getting to sleep. That's oftentimes that's underlying anxiety, those sort of unclosed files of the day. So even baseline SSRIs can be helpful if they can't tolerate trazodone. Sometimes we'll use mirtazapine. There can be very mild anticholinergic effects with that, but it can um, it can be helpful for the insomnia uh, picture. And then there may be a role for cannabidiol, right? So CBD, um, that's being actively studied. So what is sleep hygiene? I think we all know what we're supposed to do, but many of us don't do these things, right? We're supposed to sort of get good light exposure during the daytime that helps set the circadian rhythm, right? And then you really want to avoid naps after 3 p.m. so it doesn't sort of mess with that nighttime sleep initiation. And you want to aim for about somewhere between seven and eight hours of sleep daily. That varies for each individual. Sometimes we'll even go six to nine if we're feeling generous, but uh, some amount uh, in that range. The uh, exercising can really help promote sleep, but oftentimes not right before bed because your adrenaline system gets uh, upregulated too much. Avoiding caffeine after a certain time frame, right? Sometimes we'll even suggest noon time being when to stop. Um, avoiding electronics in the bedroom, right? And keeping the dark, the room dark and quiet with sort of a white noise or running water type of sound machine, right? All these are good sleep hygiene habits. Sometimes we even recommend, you know, what, what can calm the mind down, right? Can you do breathing exercises? Can you do meditation? Can you do reading, right? Something that maybe not reading the Tom Clancy novel though, right? Maybe some relaxed reading, something that will help promote sleep. And so there's always, there's this like very simple three, two, one method of what you can recommend to patients. So really you shouldn't be eating three hours before bed. Um, shouldn't be drinking things two hours before bed that can result in frequent urination at nighttime. And then uh, really no screens about an hour before bed, right? So if somebody's got sleep issues, then, then sleep hygiene is by far and away where we have to start with that. Um, for daytime sleepiness, by far and away, the most common cause of that is sleep apnea and treating it uh, is the gold standard there. We do, so in some patients for treating their sleep apnea, they're still having a lot of daytime sleepiness. Sometimes they need a neurostimulant actually. Um, our patients with Lewy body disease, daytime sleeping is just part of the disease. So um, modafinil is what I prefer for most of my patients. That's, it's been best studied in Lewy body disease, but certainly um, there's other options out there. And if these kind of just kind of, you know, melatonin, trazodone, CPAP treatment, stimulants, you know, they're still having a lot of sleep issues, then that's a reason to refer to a sleep specialist, right? Um, there's some newer agents out there that are kind of exciting. Uh, one of them may even be neutral or beneficial for cognition. And so, you know, I, I haven't looked at all the data on these, so I'm not going to speak um, to them too much, but there are, there are newer drugs coming out that may be even more helpful um, for both insomnia and daytime sleepiness, much more than things like Ambien and, and other benzodiazepines. So in summary, you know, sleep problems are highly prevalent in neurodegenerative diseases. I, I've never met a patient with Lewy body disease that doesn't have some sort of sleep issue. Um, and that's true too for most patients with uh, other, you know, Alzheimer's disease um, and, and other uh, conditions. Um, there's actually a problem of CSF clearance uh, with uh, sleep apnea. Um, so that's that's one of the pathophysiologies of this. Um, and then there is this bidirectional effect of Alzheimer's disease um, and sleep apnea. And this sort you know, I, I would suspect, right, if, if we were more aggressive with what is that sort of early life risk factor, maybe, or I should say midlife risk factor for developing brain diseases down the road, right? Sleep apnea is severely under investigated. And I think that would be a, a key primary prevention strategy that we need to take more seriously when we think about overall brain health. So I will go ahead and stop there. There's a few things in the chat. Um, let me just take a peek at those. Yeah, so I'm just going to go in order here. Uh, there's a, the CME code stuff. So good, good, you guys got those. So do you perform an ESS on all patients that present with cognitive impairment? Great question. 
Um, I don't. I wish I did. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty basic uh, with my sleep questions. I mean, I we do an ESS in all of our cohort patient, you know, like folks that are on our research side, we, we do an ESS there. Um, but I just don't have enough time to do a 24 question questionnaire. Uh, so I'm just asking about daytime sleepiness and snoring. If I've got either of those and I've got somebody with cognitive impairment, uh, my threshold to get a sleep study is pretty low, right? So uh, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Um, and then I noticed you specify encapsulated time release melatonin. That's a great question. So um, it depends on what you're using it for. So um, I will see our sleep specialists often use the the time release formulation um, specifically for the REM sleep treatment because, like I kind of said, that two to six a.m. time window is is more often when you're in REM sleep. So if you've got the immediate release, it might help you get to sleep, even though that's kind of not usually the issue in folks with like Lewy body disease. They they don't have problems falling asleep. Um, but it it'll it'll last longer for that two to six a.m. window. So so the time release um, can be very beneficial, especially if you're getting a story of yeah, you know, still waking up around three a.m. My spouse is swinging at stuff over there uh, very commonly, right? Um, then then try the time release formulation and then escalate the doses as needed. Um, but if the problem is for insomnia, you know, you can actually you can get ones that have a certain percentage that are immediate release and another percent, certain percentage that are time release. So that could be helpful if you've kind of got both going on, but um, all right. Any other questions and feel free to unmute yourself or type it in the chat. Let's see what time we're working with. Oh, that is, that is an interesting, uh, I, I can't quite hear you. Maybe maybe type it in. That was a, it was like a sped up version of, of what you were saying. Didn't come through. Give you some time to type it in. Uh, any other questions at all? I, I've got another talk in about three minutes, so I'll be jumping off shortly. But if nothing else, maybe I can go get some water. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, we currently have, oh yeah, we do have a sleep study, right? So, so we've always got different types of studies, and, and one of the ones we're actively enrolling in is called Siesta, so that's um, looking... Can can you uh is that is that looking for folks with cognitive impairment or just sleep apnea or sleep problems in general? Just so I can in general. Very good. Yeah, it never hurts to refer to our research team. They will they will help uh see if the patient qualifies and um and see if see if uh, they can get enrolled. So it never hurts to receive research referrals. Uh, all right, I'll take one more question here. So is sleep study and CPAP helpful in moderate dementia? That's a great question. Um, there is sort of a uh, when when I'm when I'm seeing a patient with more of I mean it's definitely severe, but moderate's kind of that uh, exactly like you pointed out, it's more of a border you know, gray zone here. Um, so yeah, the pathology is more advanced, uh, but you never really know. I mean, what if like 20% of their cognitive issues was due to untreated sleep apnea, right? What if you get 20% improvement in cognition, right? We don't know that uh, up front. I do try to like get a sense of, as I'm talking with the patient, the spouse, like, do you think they'd be able to tolerate a CPAP machine? Like, you know, if, if I, if they can't even tolerate the testing, right? If I'm worried about bringing them into the sleep lab because of the stage of their dementia, they're probably not going to be able to understand that, uh, um, you know, that, that timeline of things. Right. And so, you know, if, if there's, if there's a lot of concerns of like, I don't think this patient is going to be able to tolerate the treatment, then why do the test? Right. There, there is that thing we have to think about. Um, but in, in some scenarios, even moderate dementia, we can see enough improvement where if, if everyone's on board with, yes, we would want to treat it if it's there then let's still do the workup. Right. So, uh, Okay, there's some information on the, the siesta study there. Yeah. 
All right. I've got to hop off for another talk. Thank you all for joining. And uh, we will be back um, in a couple of weeks. So, all right. Take care.